My name is Matthew Vashur, I run the Bible Protector Ministry and uh, there's been a bit of a dialogue on YouTube and a bit of uh, toing and froing and hey, I, we don't mind that toing and froing as far as um, pointing out uh, some uh, problems but also, um, you know, there's sometimes interesting points people bring up as well and that's been from a fellow called John Mark Johnson Jr. who runs his YouTube channel called uh, Relationship and Truth. I run um, by Protector and there's a Bible Protector channel on YouTube and uh, having a look at some more of his background what he's on about um, he seems to be part of the Assemblies of God in America uh, which is obviously a Pentecostal denomination but he seems to be in a niche part of that group because it's his beliefs and approach are not ordinary or normal as far as you know what what the sort of mainstream Pentecostalism is like um, in Pentecostalism, that kind of Pentecostalism, in, and I'm taking the example in Australia of, of what we can see here in Australia from my own perspective, is you have either sort of an, an emotional kind of oriented um, in, an entertainment type of uh, Pentecostalism, um, which might be like Hillsong, you know, it's very oriented towards um, sort of the, the experience um, and then there's more a um, pr little bit more traditional style Pentecostalism um, but um, the current state of affairs of, of Pentecostal this is mainstream Pentecostalism is that um, they're quite weak they're quite weak on on the doctrines they formerly held um, the understanding on doctrines like healing is not very high um, if you go into other styles of Pentecostalism there's obviously different kinds of other groups you know there's different kinds you know there's like um, charismatics and so on and and there's different kinds of other kinds of Pentecostals groups such as those that might emphasize more the so-called spiritual warfare type um, ideology which is in line with C Peter Wagner um, and and all his followers um, and and other such things like that like Rick Joyner and those kind of people um, and then there's um, there's things like more periphery the revival centers style approach which is again quite different and then there's the Potter's house um, which is very oriented towards both emotional um, personal experience and the 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 uh, sort of almost forced necessity to go out street preaching um, so that that's the um, Potter's house um, and these these are all what you can see in Australia and I'm saying that because I'm in Australia and finally what I'm involved in which is word of faith and traditional Pentecostal word of faith um, which is not only word of faith but um, staying with uh, you know using the King James Bible things like that which is actually you know I mean if you look at the word of faith teachers like um, Kenneth Hagin and so on um, the King James Bible was certainly used by them but just to emphasize that a little more strongly in far as saying um, actually the King James Bible is is actually right um, fully right uh, without you know having the need to to change something in it um, but to be aligned with a, with a word of faith view that's where I'm coming from and so anyway so it's just interesting to see this fellow John Mark Johnson or relationship is truth as he calls himself uh, that he seems to be oriented toward um, some clearly what what gets taught in Bible colleges this these days are the modernistic approach towards um, you know you have to learn Greek and so on um, that that's very much an emphasis now um, and has been uh, to the point where you know in certain Bible colleges and charismatic influenced ones you can even have elements of liberal theology and higher criticism ideas not very well taught perhaps but certainly seeping in um, and that's already been happening for a while um, and I'm saying that from experience so as we see here um, this fellow uh, relationship and truth um, as we'll call him uh, he he has taken in his sort of niche understanding or his niche kind of view of of Pentecostalism um, is is much more um, nearer to a some sort of restorationist slash almost ritualistic type of 
um, approach, taking in um, almost some elements of Eastern Orthodoxy. And that's certainly in, uh, and, you know, by the way, I'm, I didn't address, but, you know, there's obviously groups that do things like, oh, we're restoring, uh, you know, the, the Hebrew roots and all this sort of stuff. And besides that, there's, you know, oneness type groups as well. Uh, there's many different kinds of groups of Pentecostalism, uh, Pentecostals and, and Charismatics. Um, but one of the strong um, particular elements that you'll see and what you see here with uh, um, with the relationship and truth fellow is and there certainly is a, a dogma about modern versionism and and that and an element of emotionalism to a degree uh, still despite you know the the intellectual side of um, the, the modernistic approach you know like well we know Greek um, rather than giving oneself over to more um, as you see in other charismatic type things where it becomes fully experiential and hey you don't need any sort of formal training at all and if you know Greek well that, that's a waste of time because you just got to know the spirit and you don't know the spirit um, so the extreme on the other side would be those people that say uh, I am spirit your word and never the twain shall meet um, basically that's that's their approach um, but this this fellow uh, relationship and truth seems to be more like um, intellectual knowledge um, and and minimize sort of the experiential which is which is a quite a sort of an interesting position because you don't see that very often in the current trend of um, Pentecostalism um, and certainly not that's certainly not aligning to what I think is the correct direction as far as um, the word of faith way to go um, but certainly is not as bad as just pure emotionalism however there is still the major problem of um, a rigid adherence to um, modernistic type of thinking but more particularly uh, specific issue that came up in discussion with him was to do with uh, his use of of uh, diagrams which seem to be eastern orthodox in origin which is uh, unusual anyway let's let's go on from that however you have some interesting problems when it comes to the king james bible because there is no manuscript out there in the world that re reads like the king james version of the bible does at all so the question is up until that time what was the word of god because they were all different than the king james both for the new testament and for the old testament none of them are read identical to uh, one another does that mean that god didn't speak in those times it seems that that's a lot like what you're saying, is that your standard is the Reformation and a particular part of the Reformation that we carry on. That's it. That's all that your argument is. Okay, that's an interesting question, and uh, it's very easy to answer. The Word of God, of course, is what was given by inspiration. The Word of God is what was used as Scripture, what was copied, um, different translations being made, versions being made. The Word of God has gone forth everywhere. Now, we understand that the text and translation of, um, you know, let's say the Latin version or whatever, um, the Vulgate, uh, obviously yeah, had some issues in it. Does that mean it's not the Word of God because of that? Well, what we've got to understand is that um, there's been a process in time, first of scattering, and that's what happened after inspiration. And then there's been a gathering process. And we can see that very clearly went into the Reformation period. And coming out, of what was the product of that was to have the King James Bible. Now today, of course, there's people who don't know English. We don't expect that they have to use the King James Bible or else. Not at all. But what we do see is a trend towards speaking English. And we do see, of course... Now it's been understood more and more among believers uh, who, who believe this um, that the King James Bible is right and so therefore even though out there there's many people going to churches not using um, the King James Bible, they're using modern versions, um, what there really needs to be is part of a restoration of the King James Bible in uh, what what is called Protestantism and the part of Protestantism, especially um, parts such as in, in parts of Pentecostalism, etc., um, is that there needs to be a restoration of using the King James Bible and beyond that. Um, an interesting quote by Smith Willsworth, and I 
don't have the reference on hand, but um, he, and so I'm not quoting directly, I'm just alluding to it, but he said it a few times, the idea that God is calling people out, calling people out, you know, for a time the Methodists had things right and God called people out. Uh, for, a, for a time, um, the Salvation Army was, was, was where the move of God was at, but God was calling people out of that, etc. That kind of idea. Um, well, we can see very clearly that in Pentecostalism, God has been calling people out of that. And what, are they, what is he calling them into? What's, what's the next stage, so to speak? Um, you know, what's the highest profession of the, the uh, Protestant uh, teaching? Well, that is the Word and Spirit view and the word and spirit view says um, basically word of faith that's that's spirit part word of faith Pentecostalism plus a King James Bible only view together bring that together and and advance forward and that is a word and spirit view and I think that's um, the advancing um, highest way that the Christian faith um, is going and that's where we should be looking and so it's very interesting then to see the kind of response that we get um, from people who say well you're using the you're promoting the King James Bible is right and perfect but as we can tell uh, the same kind of arguments always come up such as well if the King James Bible is right what about before 1611 well the whole point here is first of all God's Word was there from the start, from the outset, when he first inspired the scripture. And uh, that there is such a thing called the sufficiency of God. And that means that God is able to sufficiently have his Bible, have his words, have the scripture come forward to people, regardless of whether or not you have a perfect text and translation, that it's still sufficiently true and so. Um, that argument does not apply quite the same with modern versions, because modern versions um, are first of all, contemporary or contemporaneous with the King James Bible to start with, and secondly, because modern versions are deliberately going against that. Um, so what we're saying is um, sincere copies, genuine copies, even where there are variations in them, both in readings and in translation, and that could include comparing the King James Bible with other Texas Receptus style um, versions and translations in other languages, um, that, that the issues, basically there is no issue with that as far as, yes, the King James Bible is perfect, but there's no issue with that because the Spanish person or wherever other country person is, is not being misled as far as they still have scripture there, even though it may not be a 100% perfect translation in Spanish. It's certainly enough um, and has been brightly, I mean, in other words, the power and uh, pervasiveness of God is above that. Um, but there is a great difference between that and a modern version approach, which is actually detracting away from the proper uh, tradition of truth. So to understand the basic argument point, it's not like we just arbitrarily pick, oh, the King James Bible, and I'm saying that's perfect, and then from that position of saying it's perfect, and then just view history like, no matter what, I don't care what you say, the King James Bible is perfect. That is not the approach. The approach is really as follows. God is in control of everything. He's got his word to us. Um, specifically, now let me talk from the specific um, vantage point. Specifically, um, God, God is word to me. You talk from a specific thing. And what you can see is through, for example, Word of Faith preachers, they were using the King James Version. So obviously, just in the providence of God, the King James Version has come forward to this very day, just, just on that basis. And you can see the King James Bible is being used by all kinds of people, anyone from Ian Paisley um, and uh, all kinds of people, um, Henry Morris, whatever, they're all using the King James Version. Okay, so what you have is what's called received tradition. And then when you look at the scripture itself, and you don't necessarily need to start from a King James Version when you say, well, now I look from scripture itself. Let's say you're using a new King James Version, for example, um, which of course is, is corrupt. Um, but, but say you're using that, there is sufficient enough of true elements in there, despite the corruption, um, to be able to look at scripture, or as much as scripture is in there, obviously it's, it's really shouldn't be called 
the scripture really in, in a sincere and honest way, um, although it contains scripture as such because there are parts. Of course, it's it's uh, aligning to or agreeing with what would be scripture. And uh, okay, so you you look at that and look at the kind of verses that talk about um, God. You know, he he he's sent his word. That's what it tells us in, uh, for example, in in uh, Psalm 68. But many other verses it te tells us very clearly, and and if you're using a King James Bible, it's it's very plain and clear, of course, um, that the scripture should be right. It should be here. It should be for us today. And when you see that, then you start from that scriptural point of view, the doctrinal point of view, that the scripture itself is saying we have the word of god today so it's not without proof there's two as i said two very strong um elements in place the external argument that you actually got the king james bible coming to you um through history and and more especially where the basis is in scripture itself and that's really the first step uh, scripture itself where if you look at it it presents the case and you can see that the King James Bible really is right. And then from there you can go forward. And so it's not some kind of uh, brainless thing to do to follow the King James Bible. It's not some kind of perplexing or, or you know, thing that's without um, proper, proper logic and proper reason. But what we see is modernism has imposed its human-based approach, um, which does not have any faith at all. You see, it takes faith to believe God's actually got his perfect word to us. It, of course, it takes faith to believe that. But the modern view is like um, they, they don't want to have or don't don't um, put any necessity for having faith to believe something. They just say, well, first of all, what, what do we see with our eyes and what can we reason about with our minds? And that's what we'll hold to. And of course, that is going to lead to modern versions because you don't just except the King James Bible is being right with that view. You will question it. And that's what they do. They question it. And further than that, they attack it. They uh, speak specifically against the King James Bible. They say bad things about it. So uh, that's, that's the reality. All right, let's keep going. Now, granted, I can understand the argument that he is going to give things a spiritual application, but that doesn't really account very well for Acts 7.14, now does it? Was it 70 people or 75 uh, people? Those are completely different. Okay, now we're talking about the idea that somehow or other the King James Bible is wrong, either in what it has in the book of Genesis, in chapter 45, verse 10, or 46, verse 26, or 46, verse 27, and compared to what it says in Acts 7, verse uh, 14, about the um, children or, or the kindred of Joseph, uh, Jacob and the number that's given three score and 15 souls is the number given in Acts 7 verse 14 which is uh, apparently a different number it appears to be a different number three score and ten in Genesis 46 verse 26 okay so the accusation is oh the King James Bible is wrong because in in um, in one place, it's following the Sep Stephen using the Septuagint, but in in the Old Testament, it's following um, what what was written in Hebrew. And they, the, this person relationship and truth, but also the atheists and so on. They say, oh, look, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Two different numbers. Uh, they both can't be right. Um, maybe there's a mistake in the Old Testament with the Hebrew, and you've got to follow the Septuagint and have that right instead. And that's the kind of argument they might make, or they'll just say, oh, look, there's contradictions, or whatever. Well, this is not how we approach Scripture. Well, how we approach it is say, the Holy Ghost inspired the Old Testament. What Moses wrote is 100% correct. It's inerrant, infallible, and we've got that in the King James Bible Old Testament. Okay, as in what Moses wrote has been transmitted through time, and we have it today. So likewise, what Stephen said, or what Luke wrote in the book of Acts, has been... Is inspired by the Holy Ghost, is infallible, is uh, totally without error, it is inerrant, and we have that today correctly, fully, in the King James Bible. 
So then is it a contradiction to have two different numbers? Well, no. Anyone who would understand about looking to the Protestant tradition will quick, quickly and easily find that there are answers to some of these questions. Some of them are more difficult, of course, don't deny, but there's answers to them. And the answers are by just studying it out, or in this case, you can actually just read what someone's written about it as well. And that's a help for us. In this case, I recommend looking at John Gill's commentary. John Gill's commentary explains, I think, quite well about why there's a difference between what Stephen said and what Moses wrote. The Holy Ghost didn't lie in either place. What the information is given is correct. You, all you have to do is understand that there are always differences um, to do with how you define the numbering and then you see quite easily why there's a different number given and it's to do with whether or not you were directly related to Jacob or whether it included the wives of the brethren of the of the of the sons of Jacob very easy to understand and the way that the numbering is is counted John Gill explains it and so all you have to do is look at that so it's no contradiction at all so really uh, it's uh, you know false to claim that the King James Bible is wrong once again um, because of course it is actually correct and this is actually what the scripture states so we do what the Bible says which is study the Bible commands us to study to show thyself approved uh, study rather than to just assume well since there's a difference between two verses in a number um, therefore the King James Bible must be wrong and we have to adjust something somewhere or whatever and, and come up with false arguments about um, well they're using different versions in in the Bible times and all this stuff and the Holy Ghost just couldn't get the story straight or something I mean whatever whatever implications people might try to draw or say that well the King James Bible is getting it wrong or whatever let's stick with what the Bible says rather than with what errors man tries to uh, pin onto the Bible that is a completely um, bizarre statement because it is not accurate in any way, shape, or form. First, the NKJV is not based on a majority text. It's based on the TR, the Textus Receptus, same as the KJV, um, exact same text. Same test that, uh, text that is put forward as the TR for the uh, KJV is the same thing that's used for the NKJV, same textual basis. Um, it's not a majority text. There's about 1,800 differences between um, the majority text and the Textus Receptus that was used for the NKJV. And it is not uh, an Alexandrian uh, text, just simply by definition, because it's TR. Okay, now we're talking about the New King James Version, which um, is based on um, a majority text view. Now, this person... Um, Relationship and truth is trying to say, well, actually, this is the facts. Um, you know, um, um, it's not based on a majority text. It doesn't have Alexandrian readings in it, etc. Um, let's just, I don't want to get involved in, oh, but you said this or you said that. Let's get down to the precision here. If you look at the readings in the New King James Version New Testament, you'll find that it matches the King James Bible almost exactly as far as its readings and therefore is Texas Receptus. However, the um, apparatus, the New King James Version actually uses a textual apparatus. Um, it is a majority text apparatus that it appeals to in its New Testament. Um, just to make clear again, there is no the majority text. There is actually a number of different majority texts. And so when someone says, oh, well, there's this many difference between the TR and the majority text, there's different majority texts, and there's also many different TRs. Uh, this is plainly the case. There's multiple editions. Um, you know, there, there could be like 30 editions of the TR, because think about it. You've got five from Erasmus, at least. You know, you've got four from Stephanus. You've got, you know, a whole bunch, seven or whatever, from Beza. You've got... Um, more like uh, Walton, Mill, um, you've got Lloyd's, you've got um, Scrivener's, you've got Green, you've got, um, and and then you've got some that sort of pretty much follow uh, previous ones as well, like um, the TBS is almost a direct uh, reproduction of Scrivener's. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different uh, 
TRs, and they differ one to another in slight ways. Uh, so the point here is the New King James Version, while agreeing textually pretty much with the King James Version, or with what we'll call in the generic sense the TR in its New Testament, it, it is actually following a majority text, text form as far as um, its apparatus, and its apparatus then, if you look at the notes, it will say like new text says this or whatever. Well, what is that new text? The new text is, uh, I think, is Nestle's United Bible Societies, which is definitely the critical text, which in itself um, takes on um, Alexandrian readings into it, into its apparatus. And therefore, in the note form that is in the apparatus of what the New King James Version has, um, it actually has Alexandrian readings in it. When I say in it now, because their approach is that the margin note or the uh, the variant reading is as valid as, or possibly as valid as, or to be considered um, with with equal or or like probability, um, it allows the reader then to say, well, I actually don't agree with the main text here. I can follow. The uh, what what rendering is given in in that footnote type of margin note. Um, so so in that way, the New King James Version, whilst presenting um, as its standard form in its normal main text readings, that what essentially is the King James Bible text or Textus Receptus, um, is not actually um, that way inclined as far as it allows for and has the idea of that you're allowed to pick and choose and and to acknowledge um, those variants as if they are plausible. That's a different approach to how the King James Bible is and how we treat the King James Bible. Um, so in that way, um, whilst um, I understand definitely the points that are being made about well, the, the New King James Version actually isn't majority text or isn't hasn't got Alexander readings in it. Yes, in its main text, certainly but it's not designed that way it was designed to allow for the so-called alternates the alternate readings to have have a, a a sway that means that as you read and study the new king james version you are allowed to according to their view um, pick and choose that you could take the marginal rendering which may be an alexandrian reading and take it in as um, the text of scripture and that includes the possibility then of chopping out a few portions here and there of what's actually in the main text that that's the way you, you can use it it's it's basically a critical apparatus no the truth can take multiple forms it is incorrect to say that there's different truths as in different versions of truth as in um, one is saying one thing one has verses in it and one has the word not there and then another book which doesn't have those verses and and uh, omits the word not or whatever uh, that they're all valid and and even though they're contradicting each other are all true it, that that's not right the differences between versions and translations in the historical sense is is um, overcome by the grace and knowledge of God and because of the scattering and gathering process God had in mind all the time that there was ultimately to be a gathering but the point is all versions and translations that the true and genuine ones must be matching up to the ultimate standard of what was it God was actually communicating you know the actual concepts the actual word the actual message okay so considering that then um, and Yes, we acknowledge, of course, there's textual and, and translation variations that have occurred. Nevertheless, these are resolved and resolvable. Um, whereas the modern version type view is, is trying to say like there's unity and diversity and, and when they're all contradicting each other or different to each other, that they're still really all the same. It's, it's, um, it's illogical thinking. Um, if they say... Oh, as a precedent, there's parallel passages or, or four different gospel accounts, and they're all different, but really they're the same. Um, that's not not a correct approach. The correct approach uh, to apply that to differ, differing versions. Uh, the correct approach is to see that that each 
person who was writing in the Bible, that is to say, the inspiration of the books of the Bible, the inspiration of the, of the Scripture, um, is all from one mind, the mind of the Holy Ghost, and there's no contradictions but complementary information. And so it, it's a reality that there's only one faith. There's not different ways to get to heaven. There's one faith, and there's one baptism, and there's one Lord. There's not five different Lords. There's one Lord. And when you know that, then you know there's got to be only one perfect form of scripture. Um, people say, well, what is this exemplary form? Is it something that just exists in the mind of God or exists in the heavenly sanctuary and uh, that's it? And then the things on earth just are sort of shadows of that. Um, or is it that God is able to get onto the earth the full truth, the full form of what actually is his perfect truth? And that's, that's the whole argument here really is about um, what actually is God's full truth and then can he actually get it manifest in time and in place. So we're talking really about textual um, accuracy and perfection and translational accuracy and perfection. That's in the King James Bible. So then that does become the standard as far as the ultimate perfect Bible. Now, as I said, um, you can have the scripture in a different language. Well, it's not going to be matching exactly to the King James Bible, beside the fact, of course, it's in a different language. But um, all the different versions and translations of the good sort do disagree in some way to each other because the, there's going to be elements of things not quite right. But that's not enough to stop the flow and the, uh, the progress of truth or the truth that they represent or what they're of. The modern versions, however, are very different to that because they're saying, you know, unity in diversity. They're saying, um, you know, the differences are of no consequence and that they can have all these variations and yet they're all the same uh, as in all the, the truth, the word of God, the very inerrant, um, so-called inerrant truth. And by the way, modern versionists don't ascribe inerrancy to scripture today. They tend to, there's a tendency to ascribe inerrancy only to what was first um, inspired or first written in the autograph. Um, so they, they put that as something special, like, oh, there's no errors there. But when it comes to today, um, they'll, they'll have a general view of um, scripture is without error and, and is infallible. But in its specific form and, and format, they won't accept it for today or ever um, and ever into the future until basically you know, the Lord comes or it's not, not this world anymore and things have passed away. And so what you can see is they don't have any belief of the power of God in history, within history. You have to wait till the end of the world to come before you get to that or, or access the perfection. And that's not a correct view of theology because that's saying God is weak and not able to really intervene properly into history and that sin is prevailing in time and error is prevailing. And that, that's just a wrong view. It's, it's, you know, like either God and Satan are equals to each other or, or God is weak and Satan is strong. It's just, it's not right. As a low church Christian, I'm okay with a lot of and that diversity because it's the reality of, of what it really means to be a Christian. All right, so just to clarify from the previous statements that I made, um, certainly uh, this fellow relationship and truth is still still adhering to an absolute truth. And, uh, you know, there's many Christians, born-again Christians, they believe the gospel, they believe um, the fundamental truths, you know. The kind of doctrinal beliefs, say, of the Assemblies of God or whatever, certainly um, what we'll call orthodox Protestant type of beliefs, that's... That's not a problem with with um, the beliefs there. So we're not having any issue on doctrines of su um, such as important doctrines of the Trinity or inspiration or you know salvation by faith or, or even that there is a baptism of the Holy Ghost or anything like that. Um, so the issue here is to do with when it comes to Scripture, however, and its preservation or or and or transmission through time that there's two vastly different views. And one is a non-doctrinal approach, although it actually is a doctrine, which is the view of the, the modern person, the modernist, um, who's saying, oh, but I just adhere to reality, 
and the other is a doctrinal approach saying, well, the scripture actually says something about it. So that's that's where the conflict actually is. It's on whether or not there is a doctrine about transmission of scripture or whether it's just purely an, a natural scientific based, you know, view of so-called reality. And this is the issue. When we understand then, and, and this relationship and truth fellow actually appeals to the reality of Christian history, you know, what's he actually saying? What, what's the view of people? They're saying, oh, but I see variations in manuscripts, and I see men are fallible, and I see men making mistakes, and I see that men can't work out what is correct. So what, what's the point here? They're talking about reality, and they're saying reality trumps um, my kind of view, which is a faith view. They're saying you can't have faith about the Word of God. Oh, yes, we can. My faith view trumps the so-called reality view. I'll tell you why. And this is where he just can't engage with what I'm saying because he just thinks it's wacky, crazy, and uh, just, like, indefensible and, you know, cannot be comprehended. And I understand why, because he's thinking purely in naturalistic terms and cannot understand, because I'm not just saying, oh, the King James Bible is right no matter what, and I've just said it, and therefore it must be true. That's certainly not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is, starting from the scripture, look at, for example, the, the teaching of um, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, and many other scriptures. You have to start from scripture, what does God say? And when God says something... For example, he tells us about his word being um, coming forward, that not one jot or tittle of it can fail, or that it's to go forward to to the, every generation or to the generations of people down the track, etc., etc. You can find all kinds of, of this doctrine of teaching in Scripture, and yet the modernist says, oh, no, I'm looking at reality. I'm not looking what the Bible says about itself. See, this is where the conflict's at. It, it is actually a doctrinal conflict. So the conflict isn't about, as I, as I want to repeat, the conflict is not about cardinal doctrines of the faith, that is to say, the orthodox Protestant doctrines of things like the Trinity and, and so forth. So what the Assemblies of God in America are teaching as their core doctrinal teachings and what I'm saying, there, there shouldn't be any conflict in, in the normal sense that there should be born-again Christians there and born-again Christians here that there should be no problem with that. When we say the word of God, we're talking about the logos, the, the expression. Once again, we see going to the Greek, you know, um, redefining th theology, redefining Protestant theology um, will happen because people go to the Greek and they'll say, oh, yes, we're not really talking about the word of God or something. They would want to redefine that. They want to talk about this, the Logos. What's this Logos? The word Logos isn't in our King James Bible. Um, it's a way of, of being able to um, tag or to, um, to basically create meaning for words and create meaning for, for statements. In other words, to actually invent doctrines, basically, for things that don't exist or, or are um, made up by modernists or whatever. Um, what we don't do is we don't say, and the actual argument then that um, this relationship and truth fellow gets onto is trying to say, um, we're not preaching the King James Bible, we're not preaching the Scripture Bible itself to the nations. We don't say, oh, here's the Scripture, look at the Scripture, and that's it. Um, that's, that's, of course, correct. We're not doing that. We're pointing to the Scripture as a means of pointing that what the scripture is actually speaking of is Jesus Christ. How do you know Jesus Christ? You don't have a mental image of Jesus Christ. You don't have an icon of Jesus Christ. You don't say, here is a picture of the Madonna and child. Therefore, this is what you should believe. And we, we're not saying, imagine this person in your mind or have this experience of this love. Or can you feel this emotional? Oh, there's something much greater than you. Feel this emotion. You know, there's parts of Pentecostalism um, that have got into that kind of thing, like experientialism, rather than to explain and say Jesus Christ um, is revealed through the Scripture. You see, the Holy Ghost certainly is representing and, and bringing Jesus Christ, but how is Jesus Christ actually coming to the people? Is by the Word of God being preached by believers. That's how Jesus Christ is coming to them. Now, of course... Um, Jesus Christ is received spiritually 
in the heart, and that's not saying you put a Bible into your insides, uh, um, but what it is saying is that the word of Christ will dwell in there richly. It's saying that Jesus Christ, the person, and as the Holy Ghost is actually representing him, um, bringing, bringing in that into your born-again spirit, basically getting you born again to start with even, um, is by the word of God and the words of God are put in there and, and are life to you. When you read the Bible, when you hear it preached, it is energizing you spiritually, basically, um, just as the, you know Pentecostal um, practices are to do so. You know, the Bible tells us that praying in the spirit um, edifies yourself. And so that's why when you speak in a tongue, it's not going to edify someone else unless it's being interpreted. And that's why the words are things that edify. Well, that scripture will edify you in the inner man because faith cometh by hearing. So it's building you up. It's a power for you. And so Jesus Christ coming to the nations, how does he come to the nations? Because it actually says it in Ephesians. It says, Jesus Christ came and preached to them that are far off. How is he doing that? He's obviously by his body, the church, uh, doing it. Obviously by the Holy Ghost with the church. The Holy Ghost is not acting just independently and, and no church comes to preach the gospel. But all of that working together, well, what's the church got it as the word of God? And so the best advance of Christianity ultimately is the church of God, which is Pentecostal, um, ultimately, that is the best um, way forward, um, coming into preaching with the King James Bible. So then ultimately having a word and spirit movement, which is advancing beyond that, is the means of great evangelism and great impact into the world, into the future. Well, that's certainly going against the modernistic type of view. And when I say modernistic now, I'm talking about um, the trend towards, oh, but the Greek says this and modern versions say that. Um, you can see that, for, for example, with the Relationship and Truth Fellow, that he wants to have his Greek lettering and, and these weird um, icon symbols and whatever, um, which are just not not part of what it means to be a Christian as far as um, uh, there is no symbolism like that. Um, the Bible doesn't say it. Um, there's no need for it. In fact, it, if anything, um, it, it's it's Romanish in it, in its execution. It's certainly not a normal Protestant tradition. And it's as I said, it's not something that the Bible requires. The Bible doesn't point to any symbolism as such. Now, quite traditionally, Protestants have used um, the cross symbol. Well, that that's you know normal in the normal sense of what Christians may use, but. These Greek lettering and, and weird pictographical um, diagrams or whatever, that, that's not in alignment with what has been th the uh, received tradition through both the broad Protestant and certainly through the specific Pentecostal um, teaching and tradition. Um, so there's no need to use those things. In fact, we don't use those things because, I mean, they're just, they're not right. Um, it, it, see, it seems like it's more of some kind of uh, um, superstition or, or um, you know, things related to other religions or, or neo-paganism or, or something else and not Christianity. So it's, it's actually a trend that why would the Holy Ghost be leading that way? Um, he's not. Uh, okay, so let's keep going. I define my terms just like you define your terms regarding infidelity. The common meaning of infidelity is basically uh, adultery within the context of marriage. That's the normal usage for today. Uh, infidelity is not typically uh, linked to the term infidel in, in common usage. We usually don't consider them synonymous. However, in your presentations, uh, you have made that uh, connection and you've defined your terms that way. Uh, relating infidelity to a particular ideology and so on and so forth. People define terms that way all the time. In conclusion, I just wanted to point out that uh, I have not actually defined infidelity in some different new novel or a personal way. What I've actually done is found that use in 18th century, 19th century books and in theological materials. They use the term infidelity based on the word infidel, 
to describe a certain ideology, which is basically sort of God deniers, atheists, etc. This is actually existing. I mean, there's books about it. There's books about it from the 19th century. Um, various books. Um, for example, I'm just thinking of um, Bishop Van Mildert. Um, I'm thinking of um, uh, George Faber. And even presently, a United States minister such as um, David Cloud used the term infidelity in its um, proper Protestant historical meaning, which is to describe the infidels, and, and that is to say the atheists, the particular God deniers, and uh, those kind of people, the deists, the, the agnostics, the, um, and all the different, you know, like the uh, materialists and the humanists and the rationalists and all that. That is called infidelity. And you can find materials, plenty of materials, really, um, out there about it. So I'm not inventing something new, um, but just being consistent with the Protestant tradition. And that's something that I, I think that, uh, you know, we'll do well with to advance forward in. The King James Bible is part of that tradition and that it's right. Um, and it was being used, has been used. You know, and I want to close with this point. The Pentecostal churches, and uh, I'll point specifically to the Assemblies of God, it was based on the use of the King James Bible. In the 1950s in Australia, they proclaimed that it was their standard version to use in their assemblies. Um, so <laughs> it's not, not a foreign and strange thing to be using the King James Bible and to be a Pentecostal at all. So I, I admonish people... Uh, I encourage people to use the King James Bible, especially if they're going to be uh, true and genuine advancing in Pentecostal doctrine.